All right, man, let's talk about NBA Open at night. I'll say it right now. Two, I'm going to count two banger games. I know one of them was a real blowout, but like I miss the NBA so much. Both of these games could have been 100-point blowouts, and I would have still had the same level of enthusiasm because, boy, I really, really miss this league. Okay, so the Celtics have their ring ceremony, and they, they dominate the New York Knicks in game number one. In the game number two, we see the new-look Lakers look like the old Lakers, but I, I'll, I'll explain it. But I'm kind of excited about Lakers basketball, but I mentioned that before. Anyway, let's start off with the Celtics, 132 to 109. These dudes hit 29 threes this game, 29 of 61, 47.5%. But realistically, if you get rid of the garbage minutes, and that, that's when you saw like Peyton Pritchard shoot every shot in the world because they wanted to set the record, when you see just basically everybody, um, um, Xavier Tillman 0 for 3, Sam Hauser 2 for 7, they're starters. This is this the, the crazy part of it all. Their starters, Tatum had 37 and 10 assists, four rebounds, shout out to him, but eight for 11 from three. Then you see Derek White, six of 10 for three. Drew Holiday, four of six for three. Al Horford, three of five for three. And Jayla Brown, five of nine. There's no way you can beat this team if this is the volume and the percentage they hit. And I've mentioned this on the podcast that I do believe, and, and we look back on it in 10 years down the line, that the 2023-2024 Boston Celtics might go down as one of the more important teams in NBA history based on their schematic, uh, schematically how they win basketball games. And as we continue to see the game evolve to be more three-point centric, this is one of the pillars of the three-point movement. Like, of course, you got the Golden State Warriors of old, or even before that, you got like the Stan Van Gundy, Orlando Magic teams. Like, Every time there's a team that say, hey, three-pointers are kind of cool, and there's another team that say, hey, we're going to take what you did, and we're going to add on top of it. And I think this Boston Celtics team did what some of these other teams have done, whether it be the Houston Rockets of James Harden. I'm just talking about the volume of three-point shots going up and say, hey, we like that. We're going to steal it, but we're going to amplify it to the third degree. Uh, uh, Missoula ball is real. 61 three-point attempts and these aren't just open three-pointers right these are sometimes heavily contested and there's a lot of conversation about the Knicks right the first game in their new era where they have uh new guys like Anthony Towns and and Mikel Bridges who we'll get to in a minute and Ojan Anobi's first game after all of the injuries whatever whatever the Knicks in my personal opinion did not play a bad game like, it wasn't a good game either, but they were very far away from playing a bad game. There is not a lot they could have done to compete in this game. Again, if the opposing team is getting up 61 threes, and I don't have the tracking data just yet. I guess in the morning we'll get it updated because I did just check. They don't, I don't, they don't have the data of what was considered an open three versus a wide open three versus a contested three. Irregardless, there's nothing they could have done to win this game. I mean, even in the percentage, at one point in this game, we're talking third quarter, the, the Knicks were shooting 60% from the field while down by 25 points. <laughs> it didn't make sense. But that's exactly what Celtics ball is right now. And I did see some conversation about on Twitter, like what happened to the game that we love here, this and that, this and that. That's not where I kind of sit with it. Um, I enjoyed this game mostly because I just missed the game of basketball. So let's talk about the Knicks because there are two pillars and Carl Anthony Towns ended up with 12 points, seven rebounds, three assists. Uh, I got in my notes here and I'm taking notes a little bit differently this season. I got like a, oh yeah, this is going to be fun. Um, the Knicks started off in drop, drop, drop coverage and it got absolutely torched. As you can imagine, the Boston Celtics is a team that, that loves for you to play drop coverage because that just means Jason Tatum or Drew Holiday or Jalen Brown can just pull up for three. That's really a non-contested three-point shot. And in the whole first quarter, they played drop coverage and it was open three, get towards, get towards, get towards. And in the second quarter, they start to switch it up a little bit, bit where they brought Carl Anthony Towns to the point of attack and let him do some things. It wasn't great. Um, they absolutely went after Carl Anthony Towns on both sides of the ball today. And I think there's a lot of things that need to be ironed out for the New York Knicks. And good thing this is game number one of 82 and not even counting for the playoffs. There are a lot of things they got to really iron out because they went at cat so many different possessions, whether it be, again, in a pick and roll or genuinely just testing his uh, testing his manhood at the rim. I was like, surprised. Like, of course, Cardin Towns obviously has the reputation of not being a very great defensive player. And they were like, that's the thing that we're going to pick on. And even on the when he was on offense, they were saying, Drew Holiday, this is your assignment. And it made it very interesting because it allowed Al Horford to be heavy in help because he was guarding Josh Hart. And though Josh Hart um, made his, his value be shown by being 
a um, a short roller and crashing the offensive glass and grabbing his rebound and the goal. Like, that's where a lot of his value is. With him not being a plus three-point shooter, there are going to be a lot of teams that going to be like, Josh Hart, do you think we're going to have a player be a roamer? And in this case, that was Al Horford. And that just mucked the game up a lot more for the New York Knicks than what they probably would have wanted. Um, the thing I thought that was interesting, and maybe this changed in the second half, I definitely watched the second half a lot less closely than the first half because... It was that much of a blowout. But in the first half, we got zero. I mean, absolutely zero pick and rolls between Jalen Brunson and Carl Anthony Towns. And I thought that was just interesting. Again, they got a lot of kinks to iron out, but they didn't use Carl Anthony Towns in a pick and roll game at all. Instead, they kind of opted for him to float around the three-point line and give him post touches occasionally. And instead, the minute that Carl Anthony Towns got off the floor and Jericho Sims checked in, the first two plays of Jericho Sims is pick and rolls with uh, Jalen Brunson. And I just thought that was interesting. I'm, obviously, uh, Jericho Sims is a way better roller as far as him being a lob threat, but I thought one of the reasons why you go out to get Carl Anthony Towns because that, when you think about the spacing that uh, Mikael Bridges, in theory, should provide and Ojan Anobi, in theory, should provide, the pick and roll between Jalen Brunson and Carl Anthony Towns is like, kind of like that bread and butter, but I guess what I'm realizing as I'm mature is that the idea of a pick and roll between your two best players may not be the thing that happens a lot because I complained all season long about the Giannis and, uh, and Damian Lillard pick and roll not really happening a ton. Maybe, maybe I'm just naive to it all, but I expected it to happen more than um, exactly zero times in the first half. Um, I'm going to talk about Mikael Bridges because he had a really rough start to this game, starting off 0-5. By the end of it, he ended up with 16 points, 7 of 13 from the field. It's cool to see him get his legs under him eventually. All of the shots that he made were basically in garbage time. The team was already down about 20 plus points, but it was a rough game, not just shooting. Um, I thought he made a couple really questionable decisions when he was the ball handler slash creator there. And defensively, I mean, you see that you gave up 61 threes. It's not rocket science to say that it wasn't a great defensive performance at all from the New York Knicks. So um, it's just, again, a lot of things, a lot of things that need to be ironed out. I'm not overreacting. The Boston Celtics three-point rate was 64% in this game. That is blowing everything from last season out of the water. And they were already historically the highest volume, uh, best three-point shooting team in the history of this league. We talked about it a few weeks ago about uh, are the Boston Celtics inevitable as repeaters? Again, if, we're, if we do want to overreact, golly, golly now you don't expect them to make 29 threes every single night obviously but there's just not a lot of teams that can match that volume because even if they shoot i don't know 36 percent from three here instead of 40 47 they still win this game that's insane to think about um so i'm excited to see again what the knicks continue to do to evolve as a team um, and the same thing about the Celtics. Will they be stopped this season? Because I don't know if there's a real answer to it. Uh, game number two is the LA Lakers winning 110 to 103. We finally get to see Julius Randle. I know we saw him a little bit in the Bulls game in the preseason, but really get to see what the identity of them were going to be with him. And the first couple of possessions, it was really Julius Randle Island. Him getting the ball at the top elbow and saying, hey, um, let's see what happens. And what JJ Redick and them opted to do with Julius Randle and with um, Anthony Edwards is on the catch, we're sending two. And that allowed Julius Randle to kind of get a few assists early on, but it also flustered him enough to, I felt like his head was out of this game once we got to around the third quarter, man. That's like the Julius Randle thing. I don't think the body length was great. I don't think the effort was great defensively. Now, like the Lakers got so many offensive rebounds in that first half, mostly because him and Rudy, and Rudy is not excluded from this, just didn't get bodies on people. Sometimes it's Max Christie from the corner, right? That's not their responsibility to get a, bo a body on the guard or Austin Reeves got a bunch of offensive rebounds. That's not their responsibility in most cases. But there were times I'm like, man, what are they doing? Why are they not boxing out what, like they normally would do? And the Lakers are an interesting team. And maybe this is what caught them off guard because um, last year they were, they were dead last in offensive rebound rate. Talking about the Lakers here, dead last, 30th. In this game, what was the actual number by the end of it? By the end of it, they had uh, 15 offensive rebounds. And majority of those in the first half, you did see in the second half, Minnesota adjust to the uh, the crash in the glass and also crash the glass themselves. But them coming out and getting 15 offensive rebounds is really interesting stuff because that's not who, what their identity was last season. But you know what? That was their identity when they won a championship. Now, I'm not going that far and saying the Lakers about to win a ring. But I'm saying that J.J. Redick has taken some of the things from their championship run and saying, why the hell did we step away from this? They were number two in offensive rebounding rate the year they won a championship. That's our recipe. That's one of our recipes. We got some big bodies. Jackson Hayes looked like fucking Derek Lively today. We got some big bodies. And Anthony Davis was dominant. Let's crash the glass, get more offensive opportunities. Because they shot 16% from three in this game. 
And they still won because of the extra points and because the points in the paint. Good boy, that boy, Anthony Davis. 37, 16, 4, 3 blocks and a steal. Mmm. What a performance. 15 free throw attempts. Mmm. Hit a 3. It was a .5 on the bet in the odds. I, I hit that. Mmm. A lot of time we were asking, with the addition of Anthony Davis, LeBron even said it himself like he wants to pass the torch to AD. This is game one of 82. I will overreact just slightly here, but this is the type of passing the torch I want to see regularly, Anthony. He was 11 of 23 from the field, and he was as aggressive as I've really seen. I mean, obviously, Anthony Davis could do this regularly, but he was just so very aggressive. I'm on the glass. Defensively, I'm there. Give me the ball and let me work. And that just stood out so much to me because there are times in the last couple of seasons where, again, Anthony Davis has a defensive impact of the best in his world, like one of the best in his world, but sometimes he did get lost. And we're like, how do we let the seven foot uh, demigod get lost on the offensive side of the ball? JJ Raddick, at least in day number one, made sure that was not the case. I was interested to see very early in the first quarter, we did get Jackson Hayes and Anthony Davis minutes. And not only that, they were running a tandem two, three zone where Anthony Davis is at the top of the zone. I'm like, whoa, okay. Now, he did practice that. They did do that a little bit in the preseason. But, you you know, you just try stuff in preseason. Um, it didn't work out great. They got out of it pretty quick because I think Dante DiVincenzo hit a corner three because Jackson Hayes couldn't close out fast enough. But, again, Jackson Hayes had a really, really good game today. Ten points, four rebounds, and a block. And the block that he got was what um, Mike Holly in that corner trying to get that three-point shot up. So, it was, you know, interesting to see some of the stuff that J.J. Redick is, is going to try to implement. I think he's going to be a guy that's going to experiment a shit ton. Like, I think he's going to run rear rotations every once in a while to try to get a grasp of what this team is. But he did say very early on, the lineup that we're going to start is the lineup that was very good last season. That is Anthony Davis, Rui Hachimura, Austin Reeves, LeBron James, and D'Angelo Russell. And today, Rui Hachimura was fantastic. Like, some people were worried, and again, they got a 33-pointers in this game, but some people were worried that the identity of the Lakers would shift more to, like, some of the other teams across basketball to be 3-3-3-3-3. Now, 33-point attempts are still higher than a lot of the games they had last season, but it didn't feel like they were just hoisting up a ton of threes, even though they shot 5 of 30. And I think part of that was the balance of having Anthony Davis dominate on the inside. So it was, again, a really, really good game. Um, Bronny played in my notes. Bronny checks in and immediately Julius Randle went into his chest. Welcome to the league. Uh, <laughs> welcome to the league. And they were really loaded in on Julius Randle this entire, entire game. And I watched a lot of New York Knicks over the last couple seasons. And this stood out to me years ago. But for some reason in this game, it just, it clicked into my mind way too much. This man, Julius Randle, jumps to pass the ball every single time he touches it. And as a guy that watched Derrick Rose in his prime, I hate to see people jump to pass the ball. Like some people do it great. Tyrese Halliburton might be the best jump passer in the NBA. Other people, I don't want jumping the pass. And he did it quite a few times. It got like lost in the air and had to dump it off to Rudy. And Rudy's the most uncoordinated seven footer in the history of basketball. And it just, it wasn't necessarily um, um, great. I, I do have in my notes, the first two plays at a halftime for the Lakers are beautiful. I got to rewatch to see exactly what those were. And then um, all day, when they checked to the sideline with um, with J.J. Redick, he was screaming one through five, one through five, saying that they're just going to switch one through five and let Anthony Davis play drop coverage in a lot of cases when it's him in the one. And I thought that was very interesting, and I thought they did a pretty damn good job switching one through five. The identity of the Lakers in their championship runs were offensive rebounding and great defense, and I thought they did both of those today. And again, I'm not saying that they're contenders because of game number one, but it was very refreshing to see a coach really go into what they're good at with the Lakers. You know what I'm saying? So um, those are all my opinions from game number one. Cannot wait to tomorrow. We got a full 10 game slate. I'm actually watching things a little bit differently this season where in previous years, I would try to put on six games at the same time, and I'm somewhat watching here, somewhat watching here, and I recognize that that's not the most efficient way to watch basketball, right? It's hard to get real, um, I don't know, cues about games and be able to take real notes about games when your mind is on four games at one time. So I'm going to try my best to pick like three to four games a night, focus on those games, and then watch the other games the next morning. So the coverage around here might just be a little bit spotty. I might miss the best game of the day. You know what I'm saying? I have to watch it the next morning. So, like, tomorrow's slate of games, I'm obviously watching Bulls versus Pelicans. You got to know I'm watching Bulls versus Pelicans. But, like, Miami Heat versus Orlando Magic might be 92 to 91. I got to tune into that. I got to tune into Charlotte versus the Rockets. 
I got to tune in to uh, Suns versus Clippers. Like, I might pick out four games to really lock in on, and the rest of them, I get to them the next day. Uh, let me know what you think about the season opener. Again, really, really exciting stuff. I'm trying my very best to bring out A-plus coverage this entire season, whether it be on here or one of my two podcasts. I'm locked in. Contract year, baby, and I want my max extension.